Hey guys, this is Alex and this is my channel Finally Functional. In my last video, I demoed using my VR shoes in an actual game. And ever since that video, I've gotten several questions from several people on how the OpenVR driver works. The OpenVR driver is the code that takes the input from the VR shoes and transforms that and then sends that to Steam to actually control the character in the game. So in this video, I'm going to go over the sample driver that I made. And in this sample driver, it sends joystick and trackpad input to OpenVR and it moves the character forward. So you can take this sample and you can replace the code that just moves the character forward with code that gets data from your VR locomotion device and then transform that and send that to Steam to control the character in the game. I made this sample because I found the samples and documentation on the official OpenVR repository to not be that friendly to a complete beginner. So if you are completely new to OpenVR and want to know how to write a driver, this is the video for you. And in addition to all the source code here, I wrote a pretty long wiki page that goes over everything that I learned and the stumbling blocks that I ran into. And I wrote this wiki page assuming that the reader would be a person who knows how to code but is completely new to OpenVR. For the rest of this video, I'm going to assume that you have basic programming knowledge, that you know how to develop in C++, and you have a fair grasp of object-oriented principles like classes, inheritance, polymorphism, and methods. But that being said, I'm going to assume that you aren't that familiar with Visual Studio, the IDE that I'm going to be using to show how this driver works. So if you don't have that prerequisite knowledge, I recommend that you go learn that stuff before you watch this video. So with all that being said, let's get started. So first you're going to need to download Visual Studio 2019. So if you have not done so already, go download that. And when you install it, you need to select the components for C++ desktop development. Or if you already have Visual Studio installed, you can go to the Visual Studio installer, this thing, and if you don't know where that is, you can simply search for it. So if you type in Visual Studio, it's right down here. And when you open that up, you can go to More and select Modify. And you can go to here and you can make sure Desktop Development with C++ is checked. I also have .NET checked, but you don't need that. Once you have that installed, you can open up Visual Studio. And if you have not done so already, make sure you download the source code from my sample. If you have not done that, you can go to the URL here and click code and you can download zip or you can clone the repository. If you're going to be doing lots of coding and maintaining a, an actual code base, I recommend you learn how to use Git or some source control system like Git, but Git is my favorite. Once you've downloaded that and open up Visual Studio, you can open up the project and here is what it should look like. If it does not look exactly like this, that could be because I have show all files um, selected here. So select the project here and you can click this. And if it looks like this, you can leave it like that if you want. But I prefer to have the display here mirror the file system. If we go to the file system, you can see what you see here is what's on the file system. Okay. And then the project is laid out where the header files go in the include folder. So here are all the header files, including the OpenVR ones, which I will talk about in a minute. And then here is the lib folder where we have the OpenVR lib file. And you need that lib file and you need the header files from OpenVR. If you do not have those and you're making a brand new project, then I will show you what to do. Go to the OpenVR repository and you can see over here for releases, you can click on the latest release and you can download the zip file here. And then once the zip file is downloaded, ex extract it and go in the extracted folder. And in headers, you can find the header files that you will need in your project. And then in lib, you will find the library file that you need in your project as well. So once you have those, you can include them in your project. And as more updates come to OpenVR, you'll have to replace these files uh, with the latest version. Or you could write a script that does that, but I won't go over that in this video. You could use something like CMake. Next, if you are making a brand new project, you'll need to go and right click the project file and go to properties. And then you can go to configuration properties and then this thing, VC++ directories. 
and for include directories you'll want to include your include folder that way you can reference your header files without having to write out the full path and then for library directories do the same thing so that Visual Studio knows where your additional OpenVR library is. And then if you don't want pre-compiled headers, I'm not using them, you can go to C, C++, pre-compiled headers, and say not using. Okay. Okay, let's get into OpenVR itself. So your driver is mainly going to consist of three classes. And the first one is the class, so I call controller driver. It's going to actually initialize and talk to your device. So if you have multiple devices that you're talking to and you want to handle that all within your one driver, you're probably going to have multiple instances of uh, a class like this. This class, if we go to the header file, it inherits from iTrack device server driver. So let's say you have three devices that you're talking to that need different code to um, handle those three devices. You're probably going to create three classes that inherit from this and they're each going to implement um, the methods from this class differently. Okay. And then when, um, when you have that all set up, you have your device provider, which basically it just creates an instance. So here it just creates instances of your um, classes. So your iTrack device server driver and it put, you can put them in a list or you can store them as instance variables. And then basically all this does is loop through them every frame. So I only have one device I'm talking to. So I just have um, it call the one, the one device here, the one driver here and say run frame. But if you again had like three devices, you would just create three instances and then call the three instances. And that's really all this class does. Um, this class is very simple and then Finally, you have the device factory, which really just returns uh, an instance of your provider. And that's basically all it's doing. So OpenVR will find this factory method and it's going to use it to get your device provider back. And then it'll use, it'll call that device provider every frame. So here it's going to call, call run frame. It's going to um, call that every frame that uh, when Steam is running and in here you can do whatever you want and you can call your drivers to update everything and to update OpenVR with input. Okay, so that's basically the three components. So the class that talks to your device and then the provider which basically just manages your devices if you have multiple of them. Otherwise it really just calls this and that's it. And then you have your device factory, which just returns an instance of your um, of your provider. Okay, so I'll go over those in a little bit more detail now. So let's go um, start at the thing that actually talks to your devices. So here, controller driver, I'm going to go over each of the methods here. So here's the C++ file, here's the header file, and again, you can control click and you can go here and read what all the methods are and how you need to implement them. And let's start with the activate method. So here in the activate method is where you basically need to activate your device and you need to tell OpenVR some stuff about your device. You need to set some properties so OpenVR knows what to do when it calls your driver. So first it sends in an ID. This is an, an ID unique to your driver. So I store it in an instance variable uh, so I can use it later if I want. But then you use that ID to get a property container. And this is where you should store all of the properties of your driver. So first, the first property that I store, and these can be in any order, the first one that I store is the path to the input profile. I'll go over input profiles later, but this driver just needs to specify the path so OpenVR knows where to go to get your input profile. Okay, and here it goes to your driver, so the name of your driver in this case, and then there's going to be an input folder, and then the um, controller, uh, the input profile file itself. And if we go to resources, here is the input profile file. Again, I'll go over it later, but there it is. And then in the G VR driver manifest, this is where you specify the name of your driver. So here I have example, and that's where 
this name comes from here. So if you call your driver something else here, then you need to take whatever you put here and you need to put it here as well. And this path will make a bit more sense once I go over the file structure of the driver, but um, we'll go over that in a little bit. The next property that you should set is the uh, controller type or controller role. So here I say it's a treadmill because I am making basically an omni treadmill kind of device. But you can go here, again I control clicked, and you can look at all the different kinds of the um, roles that VR driver or open VR driver devices can have. And then we set the scalar components. So you can see here I call VR driver input. This is where you tell OpenVR what kind of input that it should expect from your driver. So in this case, I'm only going to be sending a joystick and trackpad input. So you can see here, I'm sending a joystick Y and trackpad Y and then X for um, the other two. And so OpenVR knows that I'm going to send a joystick and trackpad inputs. Okay. Again, control click, we can see all of the things we need to pass in. So our container and then the name, so joystick. And then you need a handle. This handle is like a unique identifier that you'll use later. Um, and I'll explain that in a little bit. And then you need to pass in a scalar type and a scalar uh, unit. So if we go here, what I passed in for joystick um, and trackpad is scalar type um, absolute and units was normalized to sides. And how I knew that was if you do go to the um, official documentation where they talk about this method, you can go here and you can see there are two um, things you can pass in for the type. And it says for joysticks, trackpads, use absolute. And then normalize two sides, joystick, trackpads. Normalize two sides, um, values can have between a one or a negative one. So that makes sense for a joystick or a trackpad. For something like a button, you would use Boolean because the button's either pressed or it's not, true or false. So you would, you'd call create Boolean component, something, um, a haptic component, you can look at that and there's all sorts of different things here. Okay, and then again if we go back here, there's even more. So there's also a skeleton component which I didn't use. Okay, and then there are many, many, many other properties that you can set. Here are some that I saw in other samples and other repositories that I found online. I found that I did not need to set them, but if you want, you can set them. So um, one of these in here, there is a, you know, a universal ID, might, might be good. And then there, I know there's a serial in here, right here. If you want to add a serial number for your controller, that might be good too because then whatever you type here will show up in the logs. But I did not need these for the sample and you can go through the header files and you can look at all the different things that you can set if you want. And then finally, if no errors occurred, you just pass back error none. Okay, next is get poise. I did not use poise in this driver. Um, poise, basically a, a driver poise. It represents the position of your devices in space and I did not use that, so you can see here I'm making a poise and just setting everything to the default values and then returning that. If you want to learn more about poise, then I recommend you can go to my wiki and if you scroll down all the way to the bottom, there's um, some links here. And if you click on OpenVR Quick Guide, this guide talks a bit more about um, quantinons or whatever they're called. Uh, Quater quaternions, and uh, you can read this guide to learn more about about these. So it goes over a bunch of stuff that you might need to know if you care about poise. Moving on, next we're going to go over the run frame method. So this method is called every frame, and you should call your device, get updates from it, and then if you need to send new input to OpenVR, you can do that here. So we have update scalar component. So up here we called create scalar component and it passed back a handle like a unique identifier. Down here is where you update scalar components. So you're telling OpenVR 
uh, for the scalar component I made that has this ID, I want to update the value here. It's hard coded to 0.95. And then the last value there. Again, if you control click, you can look at all the different values here. There could be a time offset. I did not use that. I didn't need any time offset. Okay. But here is where I'm just hard coding it to 95. So this is joystick Y and trackpad Y. And with, 90, uh, with 0.95 or basically 1, it'll just move your character forward. You can change this to negative 1 if you always want the character to move backwards. And then X um, values are for left and right. And then uh, you can take the sample again and you can just replace this with code that actually retrieves data from your device and sets these values appropriately. Okay, and then the next method is deactivate. When OpenVR is closing down, um, this method is called and you can dispose of anything that you need to dispose of or turn your, turn your device off or do whatever you want. The next one, get component. I really still don't understand this method and I experimented a bit with it. You can always return null is what I found. I saw this in another sample um, and this is a driver input so I just say return this but I also found that you can just return null if you want and this method really doesn't seem to affect anything. Okay, And then enter standby so if your device has some low power mode that you want to use when, um, when, when it goes into standby mode, when OpenVR goes into standby mode, um, you can call your device to go into low power mode from here. And then debug request. I did not use this and this code was just in samples, but if you want to use that, you can look at the, again, the um, comment header for this and figure out what to do with that, but I did not need to use it. And that's it for this class. So basically, in Activate, you can set up all your properties for your device. And if your device needs some initialization, you can do that here as well. And then get poise. If you have some position information that your device can send, you can use this method for that. But I do not use that in this sample. Run frame. This is where you send updates to OpenVR based on the data from your devices. Deactivate is called before SteamVR is closed down and you can turn your devices off or do whatever you want. Get component I found really doesn't do anything at least for this sample. Enter standby if you want to go into a low power mode and then debug request I did not use. Okay on to the next method or uh, sorry not method class. So the device provider. So here's a C++ file, here's the header file. This needs to inherit from this class I server track device provider and let's go and look at the methods that you need to implement. So there's an init method, cleanup, get interface version, and run frame. Oh, and then should block standby mode, enter standby, leave standby. Okay, so going back to there, first with init, this is called um, when, when your driver is being initialized. So what you can do in here is you can get you can init the driver context. I just found this in other samples, so I do that as well first. And if there are no errors, or I'm sorry, if there is an error, then you can just return that error because if there was an error, then you probably don't want to do anything else. And then here is an example of how to log out to the log file that SteamVR uses. I'll talk about the log file, file later, but in any point, if you want to write a log, you can do that. So like if we go back to if we go back to the class we just went over, if during a frame you want to log something, you can do that here as well. So you can say something like, you can do that. And then this will go out to your log file so you can make sure that this method is actually being called. And then here is the um, class that we just went over. I create a new instance of it when the provider is initialized. And then you need to actually add your controller to the list of track devices. So here it's an example controller. And again, this name comes from the VR driver manifest. So example here, example here. And then you always need underscore controller, it looks like. 
Um, every other sample did that, and it looks like you just need to always add this after the name of your driver. And then it's a track device controller, and here is the instance that you pass. And then later on, OpenVR will use this to call your driver. Okay, and then in cleanup, if you need to do anything before OpenVR, um, before your driver is unloaded, then you can do that in your cleanup method. So here I'm just deleting the pointer and then get interface version. Every other sample just returned this value, so I am too. In run frame, just call your controller run frame. If you have multiple controllers, you can call all of them here. So again, uh, just calls run frame, and then it goes into here and calls all your scalar components to be updated. And then should block standby mode, if you want your device to block Steam from going into standby mode, you can say that here. I just say false, don't block standby mode. And then here is entering standby and leaving standby. So if you want to do something when you enter standby, um, call it here. If you want to do something when you leave standby, you can do that here. Okay, so that's it. So this class is pretty simple. Just initialize all of your different controllers in here and add them to the list so OpenVR knows where to get them. And then any cleanup or standby stuff, and then every frame, just call your controllers. Next, and finally, is the factory. So um, factory methods, you can, if you want, you can go Google factory method or um, factory pattern, and you can learn more about why it's called a factory. But basically, it just pumps out objects, like a factory pumps out cars. This um, is responsible for creating a um, an instance of an object. So here is the provider class that I just went over and all it really does, all this um, method here does is return the, um, the provider if the interface name that is passed in is a iServer track device provider. Okay, just return that. Otherwise it just returns null. Okay, and that's really all this does. And you need to have this stuff here. You can just copy paste that but that's really it. So one method and pretty simple, it just returns an instance of your provider. Next, there are several different config files that you need to know about here under the resources folder. So let's start with the input profile. So I've opened up my input profile. And if you wanna learn a whole lot about that, you can actually go to the official documentation and this page does a decent job of covering the input profile. So. I encourage you to read through this, but the input profile is used to tell OpenVR how applications are bound, um, application actions are bound to input states. So let's go over this file pretty quickly. So JSON ID, it's an input profile. And then controller type, uh, again, here's example from the name of the driver from VR driver manifest and underscore controller, just found that that's what it wants. And then legacy binding, I'll go over legacy binding in a bit here, but you need to specify the path to your legacy binding file. And here's my legacy binding file. And then device class, you specify here, it's a track device class. And again, um, the different values that you can specify are here, and you can find that in other samples. And then the mode so this is a single device so here they talk about single device it's um like a they say a gun style controller um or you can have uh, handed controllers like one uh, device that's used devices that are used in, in a pair and then um, different uh, more things so an image for your device so when you go into the binding ui in in steam vr you um, can see this image and you need to specify this image. I thought at first that if I did not specify this, that it would be fine. It would just default to something. No, uh, it will cause a problem where you will go to your binding and it'll be empty here and there will be nothing in the log file to tell you what is wrong. So yeah, just put some SVG file here. I think it could even be blank and you'd be fine. And then should show errors. I just said yes. And then input sources. Just like you told OpenVR in the code that you're going to have joystick and trackpad input, 
here you need to tell it as well. So here I say it. this driver has joystick input, but there's no clicking on the joystick and no touch stuff. And then trackpad, um, same thing. And that's the input profile. Next is the legacy binding um, input profile. And this, it seems like the input profile that they have here is a new format that you use for specifying input and action binding. But they also have this old format. And from what I've researched, it looks like pretty much every VR game out there still uses the old format. At least I checked, um, I checked Skyrim and Doom and a few other games, and they still use the old binding. So you'll want to be familiar with the legacy binding. And they do have a little bit in the open VR documentation about the legacy binding, but there's really not much here. And this was my main sticking point when I was learning this myself. I had no idea how to write this thing, and it took quite a while to learn how and to piece together everything because there was nothing here to help. So uh, here it's just a legacy binding, and then you have haptics and poise. I don't have any poise elements here. And then source, it's kind of the it's kind of similar to the new style where uh, you you specify here the trackpad and joystick. But I just found these in samples and other um, input profiles that I found. And I'll show you guys how to find other input profiles in a little bit. But here, similar to the regular um, the newer input profile, uh, it specifies trackpad and joystick input. Here you can see it says it's a treadmill input. And then it's legacy, controller type. Again, same thing as the new one. You can have a description, type whatever you want here. And then a name. I think you can type whatever you want here too. And then options. Um, here, what I found was important was return binding with left hand, especially with joystick or trackpad. So the joystick and trackpad input from your device, it will be bound to the left hand controller is my understanding. You want this to be true. I found that if this is false, it doesn't work at all, at least with the games that I tried. So you'll want a um, legacy binding profile like this. So like I said, I needed to look at examples to see how this file is formatted. And the way I did that was I looked for a driver that is similar to mine. So I'm making a VR locomotion device, so something like Cyber Shoes or maybe Cat Loco or something similar to, like that. Or if you go to, again, my wiki, there's um, more examples here and they have input profiles as well. But let's take Cyber Shoes, for example. You can download um, their driver from Steam and then if you go to where the input profile is, so here at this path, and go all the way to Steam Apps, Common, Cyber Shoes, Resource, Input, you can see they have a whole bunch of input profiles here. So it looks like they have different input profiles for different games. And you can take a look at their main input, input profile, and you can see where they specify their legacy binding. And then you can just look at theirs to get an idea about how uh, about how you should make your input profile. And the last config file is the VR driver manifest file. So I've mentioned it a couple times for the name, you can give your controller a name and then in those other spots where you specify the input profile, you need to use this name. I found that always activate has to be true. Otherwise the driver just did not work. And you can read more about the other fields on the wiki page here. We've gone over the code, we've gone over the resource files. Now you can build the project. So I've already built it, then I'll rebuild it. Okay, it's done rebuilding. And when you build the project, it generates a DLL, which goes in here. So X64, release, and then here's the DLL that you need. It goes there because our build configuration is release and X64. That's what you need for OpenVR. And now we need to take this DLL and those resource files and put it in the Steam VR driver directory. And that is up here. So you go to this path on your system and you go to Steam VR and then drivers. And here are the drivers that I have. 
And what you need to do is you need to make a new folder with this structure. So in this case, we'll name the folder example because it's the example driver and then a bin directory. And then for Win64, you'll put your DLL on there. You'll have resources folder and icons and then your, um, your game icon for the UI bindings. And then in input, you have your input profiles. And then finally, on uh, at the root of your driver folder, you have the manifest file. So I've set up the driver folder structure. So example, and then into bin, and when 64, we have our DLL. And you'll notice that I have renamed it before it was named this, based on how I named the project file. You need to rename it to this. So it's driver underscore, and then the name of your driver. So in this case, in my manifest file, I set example as the name, so example goes there. You need to name it this way, otherwise SteamVR will complain in the log file that it can't find this file. Then we go up, and there's the VR driver manifest file at the root of the driver folder. And then under resources, we have icons, and here is the icon for the binding UI. And then under input are the two input profiles. So the path in the input profiles kind of mirrors what the actual file path is. For some reason, you don't have to specify in the resources folder, but that's where this comes from. And then this string here, where it's in the brackets, that seems to be what tells SteamVR what driver to look in. So now you can actually load up SteamVR and it'll try to load your driver. And you can look at the log file to see if it's successful. The log file is located up here in Steam, and then you go to Logs, and it's the VR server log here. And then in here, there is a lot of stuff, and the way, the way to find the lines that pertain to your driver is whatever you named your driver, you just search for that. So I would search for example, but I pulled this log file from my computer that has my actual driver that I used for my VR shoes. So for that one, I had I named my driver FF for finally functional VR shoes. But for, ex for the um, example driver, this would just say example. And you'll have a log here. This log comes from the log line that was added here. I have the same line in my VR shoes code base, but it just has the name um, that's different. That came from that line of code. And then here, Steam VR is activating the driver and I gave it a serial number and then it says it implements these interfaces that comes from the actual class that it implemented and it loaded my driver here. Okay, and if you have those lines, you know that your driver was loaded successfully. If there was a problem, then look in the log file and see what's wrong. And then for testing your driver out further, you can go to your settings in Steam and then go to controllers, test controller. And then when you go here, um, you should be able to specify your, con you, you should be able to find your input profile here, your controller's input profile. So here it's the treadmill one. And here you can see that there is this dot that's pointing up that indicates that on the joystick you're pushing it forward. So remember that in the driver we specified that the value would be 0.95. So it's point, it's um, almost all the way up to positive 1 and it's always there because the driver is just continually sending 0.95 every single frame. And this is the way you can know that your driver is actually sending input. And um, this is the point where I got where this was working because my input profile and my code were set up correctly, but then I had to go and look into all that stuff with the legacy binding file because, he, because even though this was saying it was working, my legacy binding file was not correct, so it didn't work in the actual game. But we already went over the legacy binding file, so hopefully you guys don't run into that problem. And then you can go back here and you can go to controllers, manage controller bindings, and you can click on whatever app you want to set a controller binding for and then make a custom one. 
and you can go into your bindings and you can change the controller and you should find your controller here. So example controller, and then you can edit the binding for that. And here, if you wanted to make a different binding for your controller, you could do that. This is another way to know that your controller is working, that the binding UI that you have is working. Because like I said before, uh, if you don't have an icon set up, then this will all be just a black screen and it really doesn't tell you what's wrong. A couple last things I want to mention is that you don't have to put your driver in this folder. For example, if you go up to common, you can see for cyber shoes, they put all that stuff in this path. And the way they did that is there is a paths file that you can modify. So if we go here, if you go to your user's app data folder and then local and then open VR, you will find this file, VR path. And if we open it up, you can see that there is this section for external drivers and you can see they have specified that's the cyber shoes driver. This happens when you install the driver. Um, they modify this file. They have specified that their driver files can be found here. So you could set up another path for your driver if you wanted to be somewhere else. For example, if you wanted it to be outputted, um, or if you want the driver to be in your project repository or something like that. I have that set up for my driver for my VR shoes. And then on that related note, you noticed how I had to go and rename the DLL and I had to manually move all of the files into their appropriate spot. You can go to your project and you can right click properties. And then if you scroll down, there are these things called build events and you can do a post build event. And you can via the command line specify some commands to run. So after the build runs, you can tell Visual Studio to copy your DLL and all your resource files to the appropriate spot so that every time you do a build with new code, it'll copy everything fresh for you automatically so you don't have to do any of that manually. And I did that in my regular VRShoes project and I'm going to leave that as homework for you guys. If you wanna see how it's done, go ahead and check out my other repository, which if you go to my profile, it is right here in VR Shoes software. And if we look at the project file here, and I go to post, build, you can see I have some copy commands here for copying everything that's needed. But I'll leave that to you guys as a little bit of homework. So that's it for this tutorial. Again, I recommend you guys look through the wiki. There's all the information that went over in this video. All of that is here. And I have resources down here for other drivers that you can look at and take inspiration from. So if you like the video, leave a like. And if you want to see more of this kind of stuff, or if you want to stay up to date on my VR Shoes project, then subscribe. See you guys next time. Bye.